Good morning. We welcome you here by video, and we're just so glad that you have joined us this morning. We look forward to spending some quality time together praising our Lord. It's a time to come together and put aside the busyness of the week and remember that this is the day that he has made and we can rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever we're facing, whatever we've been facing all week, this is a time to just come to his feet and be refreshed and to praise him and to be in his presence. We'll just start our little meeting with a quick prayer. Father God, we just thank you that you are indeed our Father, how you reach out and touch each and every one of us, care for each and every one of us, how wonderful it is to be the lively stones fitted together that is your church. And Father, we just come to you this morning bringing all of ourselves, the bumps, the bruises, the hurts, the scrapes, and also, Father, the joy and the enthusiasm We just want to revel in your presence and in who you are, how majestic you are, how great thou truly art. We just thank you and praise you this morning and ask for your spirit to be amongst each and every one of us listening to my voice this morning and again and within your greater church throughout the world. We give you thanks and praise and join our voices in with our brothers and sisters in praising you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start with uh, an old favorite. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood I repented of 
Good morning. I'm going to be reading from two places in the scriptures this morning. The first I'm going to be reading from will be from Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. And we'll be reading about when the gospel of Christ was embraced by Lydia, who is from Thyatira. So the Apostle Paul's on a missionary journey. He's taking Silas and Timothy, Timothy with him. And we begin in verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And... Moving into the book of Revelation for our second reading, we will read the letter to the church in Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 28. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these are the words of Jesus. This is a direct letter from Jesus to the church. The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, And whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, and faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless, unless they repent of her works, and I will make her and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, have not learned what some call the, some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he, and I, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. to share one more song with you before Nori brings the message, Salvation Belongs to Our God.
Well, I hope that you are doing well today. I want to say good morning to you. I know that for some of you, you are listening this morning, but for some of you will be listening later. So for some of you, good morning. For some of you, good afternoon. And for some of you, good evening. I hope that you're doing well, uh, such is the nature of doing this online service. Um, but wherever you are today, wherever you are when you're listening to this, I do pray that the grace of God will touch you that you will hear and meet Jesus Christ in a new way. So, Lord, I ask that. I ask that you would mysteriously and powerfully move among us as you have been in a unique way now as uh, we look into your word, that your word would seek out the hearts of people, that you would touch people's minds, that you would touch the inner life of people, whatever they're working through, whatever things that are in their life that... Uh, you know they need whatever they need to be touched, that you would do that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we are going to look at the longest letter to all of the seven churches. Uh, this morning, I'm going to try and stray, strike a balance between talking a, about in just enough detail that we do justice to the text and to what Jesus is saying and to the historical things going on that are really very important to to drawing meaning from the passage and application from the passage, and yet giving enough time, on the other hand, to apply uh, how what what does that mean, that ancient letter mean for us today. So I'm going to skate a little bit quickly over this, this passage this morning, and... Uh, and again, here's another plug for the study class coming sometime, God willing, hopefully in the spring, where we can talk in more detail about these things. So Jesus writes to the longest letter to the most insignificant church in all of all of Asia Minor, all of Western Turkey. All of the seven letters, this is the most insignificant, in a cultural sense, insignificant church. Uh, we know... We know the least about the city of city of Thyatira, uh, and uh, that has to do with the fact that there has been uh, very little archaeological discoveries and digs made around the city, and very little written in ancient literature about the city of Thyatira. How, however, there is there is some that we know of. So. Thyatira, to, to go to Thyatira now, we, we go from the city of Pergamum, which was situated on a, on, a, on a hill, as we talked about last week, and we're heading southeast. We're going about 72 kilometers further inland to the south, southeast, and we're going down from the mountain, we're going down into a valley, the Lycus Valley, uh, into a very flat area, a very open plain. And this city was left in the open. It was unprotected historically. It still is. Because of that, it was always vulnerable. And it was always in this state of uh, vulnerability and change because it was always being conquered by other forces. And therefore, it had a history of instability. And it was also situated on the most important junction of roads between the regions of Amicia up to the northwest and Lydia to the south. 72 kilometers southeast from Pergamum, the capital city of Asia. The city was prominent and became prominent uh, in two ways. First, it actually became a military outpost that served in the open plain, it just sat there and it served as a way to protect the city, capital city of Asia in Pergamum. And so it became a military outpost for that purpose. In another way, it became important because it actually became a center for, for trade and for commerce and for manufacturing. That really was the DNA of Thyatira and what it came to be. Uh, that is a has a big, big part of our message this morning. And so as Rome developed the, entered into the Pax Romana, which was this age of peace that lasted for about 200 years, where Rome just developed in prosperity and peace and everything, you know, from Rome's perspective, everything was just flowing perfectly. 
They had roads. They had solid roads connecting all the to the all the major centers that 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 enhanced and made the commerce uh, uh, flow freely and powerfully from all these centers. And it was just as as that Roman peace was starting to develop that Thyatira, this letter to Thyatira is from Jesus is happening right now. It's just on the uptick, the upswing of that Roman peace. And so things from a from a place of finance and commerce were going really well in Thyatira. So let's get into that letter with that little bit of background. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, Jesus is writing, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. This is the only place in Revelation where Jesus uses the title of Son of God. And that is because, again, we're coming back to that theme. Jesus is intimately acquainted with all your ways. This church in Nanus is intimately acquainted with what's going on in the community of Nanus, the Nanus corridor, corridor, and how that affects our church, like he does with every church, in every community, wherever it sits. So it is in Thyatira. The only place in all of Revelation Jesus uses the title of Son of God. Why? Well, very interesting. The patron god of Thyatira was one of Zeus's sons, Apollo, who was called the Son of God. And so Jesus is saying, no, 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 Apollo, I'm the Son of God. These words are coming from the Son of God. There's no other Son of God. Make no mistake about it. Again, Jesus is intimately acquainted with what's going on in culture and what's going on in your life and in the life of your church and our church. His eyes are like a flame of fire, which symbolizes the penetrating insight and judgment of God. We could go to Daniel, Daniel chapter chapter 10 and back to Revelation chapter 1. And, and the feet are like burnished bronze, which we'll talk about in a moment, has a direct relation to one of the trade guilds that existed in the city of Thyatira. He commends them of good things. Really, really good things. He opens his letter saying, you're excelling in four ways. Verse 19, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. Love, faith, and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first, meaning you have grown. You have developed. You have Growing stronger in these ways. The word work in Greek actually meant behavior. We need to just kind of pull back for a minute and change the way we think about work. Spiritual works. Jesus isn't talking about deeds. He's not talking about a list that we do. He's not talking about a program that the church was involved in. The word works in Greek meant behavior. That was the overarching theme of what the word work meant. Behavior. That meant, that meant that these things were happening, these four things, these four areas were, were coming out in their lives, in their behavior naturally as they interacted with the community. I remember in a previous church, shortly after I was hired, There was someone in the church that was a very energetic individual. He right away wanted to take me out for lunch and kind of pick my brain on a few things, find out what was going on inside my heart uh, as a pastor and what what was going on with some of the vision I had for the church. And I'll never forget, sitting across from him, he directly asked me, he said, Nor Sunori, what's your vision for evangelism and church growth for our church? And I said, my vision... For evangelism and church growth for our church is what you and I do with our neighbors. That's my vision. I don't have a specific program. It's what you and I do and everyone else does with the people they live right beside. That, friends, was what was going on here. Behavior. It's organic. It's integrated into life and relationships. Jesus didn't say, you are excelling in the programs you started in your church. You're excelling in the deeds and all the lists that you do. You're excelling in busyness. Good for you. No. He didn't say any of that. He said, I know your behavior. I know your behavior. The way you love. Your faith. Your service. Your patient endurance. And that, compared to before, wow, you've grown so much. 
Good for you. I know. Remember that word I know now if you've been listening to these messages. That word I know coming from Jesus was all they needed. It symbolized and said to them, I'm intimately acquainted with all your ways. I know and you have my commendation in this way. So, all is not well though in the church in Thyatira. All is not well. And so after the commendation comes some correction. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Thyatira, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, was, was a center for manu- manufacturing and trade. And the way that commerce was processed was through what has been called trade guilds. And the, I mean, the best picture that anyone can, can give you to what an ancient trade guild was like would be a modern day or a relatively modern day uh, work union. So the steel workers, the pipe fitters, any kind of trade union would be the closest parallel you could have to an ancient trade guild. But even then, it breaks down. So, and, and I'm not trying to cast any shadow on any unions today. I'm just saying there's some similarities in terms of how that how that was uh, processed when it came to to trade and commerce. But the trade guilds. The trade guilds were everything in the city of Thyatira. They were absolutely everything. For people to maintain their livelihood, some kind of connection and membership in the guilds was an absolute necessity if you were going to make it financially in the city of Thyatira. And in most most all of the ancient cities in, in Asia Minor, that was the way the trade guilds were there. But in Thyatira, th- there was no other city like this where the trade guilds just absolutely made society. You had to be part of a guild, otherwise you didn't make it. So each craft person, we're talking about merchants, tanners, potters, bakers, welders, wool and linen workers, sellers of cloth, various metal workers. Jesus said, my feet are like burnished bronze. He's talking about the the metal workers. He's right there. He's right there. And so these, these, these guilds were not, they weren't obligatory. You weren't obligated to be part of one. But very few workers did not belong to one of the guilds. And so both physically and as a society, these guilds were the very heart of civic life. And so Thyatira was laid out in squares. And each guild controlled a portion of the square. So the metal workers controlled a portion of that square. And the, the ones who sold dye, made and sold dyes. Very, very super expensive dyes. Unbelievable. Like, like Persian rugs kind of thing. Very expensive. Would have a portion of that square. And, and on it went. Well, friends, for the, for a Christian, this, this meant that it was mandated that if you were in, Involved in any aspect of the manufacturing trade in that city that you participate in, not just the guild, but the things that came along with the guilds, which meant the guild feasts, which involved meat being sacrificed to idols and rituals in the cult and worship of their patron gods. Since the, the specific patron gods of these guilds were always worshipped at the feasts. And at times, in addition to worshipping an idol at a meal, this would involve sexual encounters and experiences. Now, you might be sitting there going, I just can't relate to that. That's not anything like the way it works today. Well, you know, I would just say, hang on. Just, just, Just park that thought for a minute and let's stay with me. We'll talk more about that. But I would also say that there's there's a there's a way of life in the ancient world that uh, we think we 
our society is free when it comes to sexuality. I mean, just to give you just a little snippet, you can go back and read from, from cultural writers outside the church, no connection to any kind of Christian thinking, that just talked about the way, their, the way their culture was when it came to sexuality. One writer said, you know, we have, we have mistresses for pleasure. We have uh, female slaves for pleasure. And then we have wives to make babies, to produce children for us. And it was actually commonly believed that male sexuality and encounters with young boys was actually preferred. We're, we're just, just a snippet. That's an ancient world that, that had no boundaries. So if you're thinking, did that really happen at these feasts? Absolutely it happened. Absolutely it happened. There was always a connection with worship and sex. Always. You go back and you can go back way back into the Old Testament and the Middle Eastern culture to the ancient Canaanite religions. Connection between worship and sex. Worshiping an idol and sex. Sexual encounters. Immorality. Adultery. And so whenever Christians refuse to participate in the feasts, because obviously such participation would compromise their faith, they would face the anger of the community. And obviously you can imagine it had severe repercussions uh, on them financially because they would lose their jobs. They would be pushed out of all commerce. Any kind of chance at participating in the economic success of the reason and making a decent, honest buck you were pushed out. So the problem for the church in Thyatira was primarily economic. Whereas in previous churches, people were losing their lives. They were physically suffering. The people in Thyatira, the believers in Thyatira, were suffering financially, losing their jobs. Now, as we look at all the information we have and we compare it with scripture, it's very likely that Jezebel taught that there was nothing there was just nothing wrong with a Christian taking part in the guild feasts and celebrations and all that went on with it the sexual experiences and encounters there just was nothing wrong with that she was teaching and in fact it was a it was your civic duty to be part of this stuff to keep your place in the economic system something you just needed to do to keep your place at the table now, Jezebel was either a code name for the woman in the church or a nickname or a moniker given to, to her by Jesus. Jesus calls her Jezebel. But, but no one believes that, that that was actually her actual name. That's the name that Jesus, a nickname Jesus gave to her because it was symbolic of a Jezebel that lived long before her, lived in the Old Testament. And we could talk a lot about the Old Testament Jezebel. Notorious, evil queen, wife to King Ahab. She was, the Jezebel in Thyatira was a self-proclaimed prophetess who in some key ways embraced a spirituality that was very similar to the Old Testament Phoenician Jezebel, the queen, actually the queen of the nation of Israel. Ahab and Jezebel, and, and, and Jezebel was known. Her legacy is known for forcing Israel, not just inciting, but forcing Israel into committing spiritual adultery or else you die by executing hundreds of the Lord's prophets and hosting and giving hospitality and embracing and lifting up 400 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. Goddess of fertility. So, killing the prophets of God, embracing and giving life and credence to 800 prophets of Baal and Asherah. The Jezebel in the Old Testament was not a self Described prophet, but she was actually seen as the mastermind and the personality behind Israel's descent into the worship of Baal. And so, worshiping false gods in the Old Testament was always, always, always seen as spiritual adultery. It's 
always cast in that kind of understanding, in that language. Going into the New Testament now, the Thyatira, Jezebel, Jesus gave her time to change her ways, but she refused. So there will be consequences. Friends, God is holy. Jesus is holy. And, and, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But before we read anything, before I read the next paragraph, I want you to just stop for a minute and realize that we, we, just, don't, we just don't come into contact regularly with holiness, pure, undiluted holiness. I mean, that's, that's something we as humanity have no idea what it's like. Yet that's God. And so God cares. He's just and he's holy. Yes, he's loving. It's like a, it's like a rope with all these different threads. He's loving. He's holy. He's just. All these characteristics of God. You can't pull one out and say, I only like this one. God has these characteristics and they're all intertwined. You can't talk about his love without his justice. It was his love that sent Jesus to the earth to pay for the sins of people. But it was also his justice that took him to the cross. Jesus said, regarding Jezebel and Thyatira, Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, which is which was a metaphor in the ancient world for sickness. I'm going to make her sick. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation. Unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. This is not referring to her physical children. This is, this is imagery to describe her followers and her disciples. I will strike her disciples and her followers dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. Now, Jesus speaks to the rest of the church who have not given in to Jezebel's teachings and practices because not all the church bought into what she was doing. Verse 24, But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. To the rest of you who have not embraced what she says and what she does. Just hang on. You're doing great. Just hang on. Hang on until I come. So what's Jesus referring to when he calls what some call the deep things of Satan? That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying he's talking about what people are saying in that culture. The deep things of Satan. Somehow following following Jezebel and, and her teachings and her experiences, people were saying, this is, if we're doing this, we're learning the deep things of Satan. Well, in the New Testament, there was a heretical movement that said, if you really want to become wise and experience more of God and the fullness of God, you actually need to explore the fullness of Satan, the fullness of evil. And for those people who believe that, it, for them it was... And Thyatira was like, hey, dig deep into the feasts, the immorality of the worship of these patron gods, and you're going to be wiser and closer to Jesus as a result. And when we, and we see Paul addressing some form of this earlier in the church in Rome in chapter 6, 1 to 4, which was a misunderstanding of what grace and the purpose of grace of God was all about. The one who conquers and keeps my works, Jesus says. Notice that Jesus says works, which was an integration of his life and teaching. The one who conquers and lives life the way I want them to live, the way I live, keeps my behavior, my works, what I do, my life and teaching unto the end, to him... I will give authority over the nations and he will rule. The word rule means shepherd. And he will shepherd them, the, the nations, with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. 
And I will give him or her the morning star. The one who keeps his works. Jesus will give him the morning star. The morning star is a direct reference to none other than Jesus Christ himself. In Revelation 22.16. I want to read that for you. Revelation 22.16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel and testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Friends, what is the, what is the point for us to consider today? I think there are many, but I just want to talk really briefly about two things, integration and compartmentalization. Jezebel taught that to have sex encounters in the trade guilds and false and worship false deities and eat food dedicated to these false deities would not hinder the spiritual worship of Jesus Christ. This was influenced by Gnostic teachings that were circulated during that day and that, that time in that first century. Gnostic teachings that said, hey, the physical body is of no value. The only thing that values is the inside, the invisible part of you that no one can see. That's the thing that really matters. That's the thing that's eternal. The body has no value. Therefore, what you experience with the physical body has no value. It's only in the invisible stuff of the soul that matters. So dig in, people. Dig in and live it up. Live and let live. It could be perhaps right there that the seeds of compartmentalization began. We do this today. I know of a story of a young man with a beautiful family, wonderful wife, young man working a part-time job, struggling to make it work in another country. He was skilled at photography and Christian man and his way of making money was taking pictures of female models, young female girls. Not underage, but young adults. Ladies. Inappropriately addressed. As someone in church saw him taking pictures at one of these photo shoots of these, uh, of these ladies. And reported that to the pastor as a concern. Not gossip, but as a concern. This pastor talked to him and he, he just wasn't understanding what, was, what the concern was. He didn't understand the whole real concept of, of the appearance, avoiding the, even the appearance of immorality or even perhaps putting himself in temptation's way. Finally, finally, the pastor just asked him, why, 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 why can you not? Like, you're so good at photography. Why don't you excel in taking pictures of God's creation or something else? So many other, just a myriad of ways that you can excel in photography. Why don't you, why, why women? He said to the pastor, he said, because that's where the money is. Compartmentalization. To think that you can do this, you can just participate in this activity over here. I think it's okay. Just kind of keep it over here, keep it clean, package, wrap it up. It's not going to affect my life over here. That's compartmentalization. Or, positively, well, at least some may think it's positive. I, I don't really think it's positive, but it was kind of funny. Went snowboarding with our, my boys. Our two boys on Friday, uh, it was... Our oldest boy, Nori Jr., his birthday, coming up on the 18th. But it was his day off on Friday and my day off too. So Cash, Nori, and I went snowboarding Mount Washington. I haven't been snowboarding in seven years. And so I, you know, I'm like, in my own mind, I compartmentalized my own abilities, my own health. And I was like, this is going to be great, no problem. Get to the top of the hill. Whoa. I compartmentalized everything. To the bottom of the hill. Oh, my legs hurt. That's only one run. I got the whole day ahead of me. What was I thinking? I compartmentalized my health. I put my health 
Seven years ago, I just put it aside. See, I'm just as I'm just as healthy as I was seven years ago. I can do what I did seven years ago. No, no, that's not the way it works. It's not the way it worked. Still had a lot of fun though. Fantastic. Friends, the biblical view of the Christian life is not it's not about compartmentalizing aspects of our daily lives, but it's one of integration. It's organic integration. Where absolutely everything is spiritual. Everything is connected. The soul is not just one little one kind of marble, sealed off marble in our body, where nothing we do with the body is, is not, it's not affected by anything we do with the body or the mind. The heart and the soul, the mind and the body, they're all connected. What we do, how we live this life in this world affects our heart, it affects our soul, it affects our mind, it affects our worship with God. And so how is it going with your soul? That's one of the key questions when we talk about what it's like to walk with God. How is it going with your soul? That might be a foreign question to you. If you're not a follower of Christ, it might be like, this is just weird. This is just really weird to even talk about stuff like this, about the soul and about immorality and uh, that this is wrong. And it just might seem so strange to you. But I would just submit to you this morning, if that's the way it feels to you, I would just ask you to just this week take a step back and just think about perhaps how you've been influenced by culture, pop culture, that just says everything's okay. Just live your life. No boundaries. But take note of the fact that nobody talks about how any of that stuff impacts your heart, impacts your mind, impacts your soul. The soul is like a sponge. It absorbs. It absorbs everything we do on the outside. And so this morning, I would just like to leave this this thought with you this morning that, that that all of life is spiritual. Even I know this this what we see physically with our eyes, how we engage things physically, everything affects our soul. And so this week, I would encourage you to just take a step back and ask God. So Lord, what what am I? What am I thinking in regards to life? What am I pursuing in my life? Perhaps what am I compartmentalizing? Is there any activity that I'm, I'm, I'm in, engaged in that, that I've been compartmentalizing that, that isn't healthy for my soul, for my life, for my worship of the only true God? We could talk about a lot of things. And, and perhaps this is, this is where some would say, you know what, Pastor, I want you to, I want you to lay out a list. I want you to tell us what things are right and which things are wrong. And I, I can't do that. I can't do that. With all due respect, I'm not casting any shade on the previous generation, but it's been just said so many times that the previous generation talked far too much about do's and don'ts. That the key to living the Christian life was avoiding this and doing that. Without talking enough about the love and the grace of God and how compelling Jesus Christ really is. And that that, that is the motivator to live a life fully integrated, in sync and in harmony with his will. And so I'm going to leave that up to you to search it out with God what's healthy for you or not healthy for you. Believing and trusting that he will lead you in it. If you really ask him. So Lord, I just ask you that you would do that. Father, I just ask that you would shepherd us. Lord, you're you're very tuned in to people's hearts. You know that for some people have just a, there's such a history of legalism, being impacted by legalism, being impacted by teaching that is just hard on doing and not doing and not enough on the love of Christ, that he loves us in our brokenness. I pray that you would reach out in all your wisdom and power and touch that person's heart. Touch all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
just wanted to uh, spend a moment to say I've really been reflecting upon um, the complexities that have come upon us in these last few days. And it's just really been on my heart that even when we're feeling very alone, that God is always with us. He's always our anchor in the complexities of this life, and it doesn't matter if uh, if we're facing differences because of restrictions in COVID or job changes or uh, personal changes in our lives with diff- different relationships. He is our anchor in the storm, and he is always with us. And when we bring our hearts into tune with rejoicing in who he is, it just makes all the things that seem so complex become so much more simple. So we're going to, again, sing our song, Raise a Hallelujah, and uh, just celebrate that even in in loneliness and, and in loss and in change, we have a God that doesn't change and is not surprised by these things that we experience. Raise a
That's what I want us to do is raise a hallelujah. But how can we do that? The way is not through compartmentalization. Statistics for a long time now, for many years, have come out and said that there is absolutely no difference between the value systems and practices with those who do not follow Christ and generally in society and those in the church. Okay, did you did you hear what I just said? Statistics have clearly have said for many years now that there's now no difference between the practices, the entertainment choices, the choices in how we engage culture with those in society who don't know Christ and the church. That tells me that we are excelling in compartmentalization. And yet we still come to, to church and worship God. And so what I would encourage you to do as, as, as we go this week, I would just like to leave you with this way forward. That imagine that there's a spotlight in your heart coming from the top, a light shining down into your heart on the floor of your heart. I would encourage you this week to reflect on that image. And then reflect on perhaps what you're, what you're thinking or what you're doing perhaps in your life that you need to rethink. That maybe you need to ask, Lord, is that okay? Or I, I actually know it's not okay. What am I going to do with it now? Perhaps you have compartmentalized the way you think about people. That you think negatively about people consistently or about a person. And that negative thinking, you compartmentalize and just set aside over here and think that you can do that and God's okay with it. Or it's not affecting your heart or your worship with God. Or perhaps there's a, an issue of forgiveness, that a, a bitterness, a bitter root that you've kind of packaged up and you've set it aside because it just it's just too painful to bring into the light of Christ. It's affecting your worship of the living God. Or perhaps there's some kind of a, an addiction. Addictions have so many roots and connectors. A sex addiction, an alcohol addiction, a, an addiction with whatever. So many ways that human beings can be addicted to things. And one of the one of the key things about addictions is people compartmentalize those addictions and just set them aside for a moment and then pull them back in and engage, wrap it up, put it back in the shadows. Friends, this the image I leave you this week is that God wants you to take whatever you've wrapped up And just bring it into the light of Christ. Just bring it into his light. And let him deal with it. He will lead you forward. Nothing is impossible with God. And so I leave you with this prayer from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. According to the power work within us. To him be the glory in the church. And in Jesus Christ. Throughout all generations. Forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all, and we'll see you in a few days.